number of years ago, uh, some scholars and practitioners uh, believed that there was a great need to convene consequential conversations about the civic good and civic activism. And that was sort of the, that was sort of the genesis of this. And gee, uh, Eric and I have been involved in this, for, this conversation for about 20 years, so, um, so that makes tonight pretty exciting for us. Um, we've described it as a spirit of inquiry that would convene, curate, and commission important projects and ideas. These projects would be aimed at developing a culture for restoring post-industrial cities. That's, you know, Beaver Falls and Aliquippa and Rochester and Midland, you know. Um, so, um, and um, with that in mind, this is our little mission statement. And, I, and um, don't worry, this is going to go long, just in case you're like, oh my gosh, this is brutal. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the Milltown Institute's mission is to help develop a culture of understanding and renewal for post-industrial towns who have experienced the rapid decline associated with deindustrialization. And I would just say what, what we mean by that is this, is that uh, the, the, the world that modernity created of factories and mills and mines um, it delivered to American society a certain kind of good for many, many decades. And then about 40, 50 years ago, things began to unravel. And as idolatries do, they, they let you down, you know. And so we, 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 now we're living in the world that industrialism created, got as much out of it as it could, and then left. And trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we do now that this world uh, is is a different world, but we have the results of that world gone gone poorly. So we're we're a multidisciplinary institute seeking to promote education, research, service, and policy formation in these distressed communities. Not that other communities don't need all sorts of things just like ours does, but this is where we want our focus to be. I want to say this too is there are so many fabulous organizations already that have sprung up in these areas. We have, a, at least in Beaver Falls, I won't talk about other uh, towns, but it, in Beaver Falls we have fantastic city government that works really, really hard on issues of the common good. And so what we want to do is we are, first and foremost, a group of academics. and But academics that stand in a tradition that says learning is not done for the purpose of, you know, building resumes and sitting in an office smoking a pipe that... Uh, Learning ought to be focused on the common good. And so as we interact with ideas and movements and things like that, our hope is to bring those into conversation with things that are already alive and happening in the community. And ho hopefully we can cross-fertilize each other and uh, bring one more piece to the table uh, to try to see communities healed and helped. So we, we hope to be formally connected soon, maybe next week, uh, with the Beaver Falls Community Development Corporation. Um, we also hope to be formally con um, connected to Riverwise, a countywide movement to try to, to try to work on these things and, and much more. And we also hope, and we're also going to uh, connect formally to Mycelia Development uh, particularly what you might know as their Portobello building, the, the new building that is going to be built. We hope to have office space in there and use the, uh, the meeting facilities as well as the catering facilities and stuff like that. Um, we also happen to, as I said, we also happen to uh, already be in, a, in an area that has four higher education institutions um, 
Geneva, CCBC, Penn State Beaver, and Robert Morris isn't in our county, but it's just across the county line. Those four schools have already connected. There's already a, there, there, there's already a, things going on between them. They call the, they, they call that connection uh, bridges to pathways, uh, and they've got a number of things started. So we hope to draw on them as well. So that's what we're up to. We're so grateful that you're here. Like Nate said, this is our little soft launch. We thought with COVID, we couldn't really have more than about 25 people at something like this. And so um, we, we, uh, we welcome you. Please keep getting more food because there is really, really a lot of food here. You know? It's really good, too. Um, so... Um, so again, thanks for being here. I'm going to uh, uh, turn things over to Keith Martell, who's going to introduce our speaker. So, so Brad and I share an office suite at Geneva College, and he walked into my office about three hours ago with this page and a half of scripted words, and he said this will probably take about a minute and a half. So, just like in the classroom, Brad. Just like in the classroom. It's a, it really is a delight to be with you all tonight and to have our guest, Dr. Stephen Garber, here. Um, he's spending the week with us at Geneva College as well, and he is certainly a great Last night I shared some notes about um, Steve's role in my own life, largely from afar for years, starting in 1997 when I read his first book, The Fabric of Faithfulness that it helped to start to make meaning out of a world that was starting to unravel during that time in my life. Um, but tonight I'm going to read the introduction uh, to move us along. So Stephen Garber is the Senior Fellow for Vocation and the Common Good for the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust. He has recently served as Professor of Marketplace Theology and Director of the Masters in Leadership, Theology, and Society at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's the author of several books, including Visions of Vocation, Common Grace for the Common Good. His most recent is The Seamless Life, A Tapestry of Love and Learning, Worship and Work. For many years, he was the principal of the Washington Institute for Faith, Vocation, and Culture, and he continues to serve as a consultant to colleges and corporations, facilitating both individual and institutional vocation. A husband, a father, and a grandfather he has long lived in Washington, D.C., living a life among family, friends, and flowers. In his book, Visions of Vocation, Steve has a poignant chapter that I was just discussing with colleagues yesterday entitled, Come and See. In ways, that's the call for us tonight. Come and see. Come and see the possibilities of this little endeavor called the Milltown Institute. Come and see a vision for places like this one, in that chapter of Steve's, we read this. Over many years and many conversations, my conviction is this. Moral commitment precedes epistemological insight. We see out of our hearts. We commit ourselves to living certain ways because we want to. And then we explain the universe in a way that makes sense of that choice. It is why Augustine's long ago question still rings true today. You cannot really know someone by asking, what do you believe? It is only when you ask, what do you love? That we begin to know one another. We see out of our hearts, yes, because we live out of our loves. So tonight as we all gather together around an object of our common love, please join me in welcoming my friend, Steve Garber. So some of you would under understand the reference historically and culturally, but when somebody first asked me years ago to do this, I said, no, I'm not going to do that, you know? And of course, at the time, it was Britney Spears who first seemed to me to have done that, and I thought, I don't want to be like Britney Spears. I'm not going to put that around my ear, and, and of course, now it seems pretty natural, and I do it too, so. Um, is this working okay, Chris? Okay, great.
Thank you, Keith, uh, for being my friend for a long time now. And Brad, for being my friend for even longer time now. <laughs> Grandfathers that we are now. Ah, how'd that happen? Anyway, uh, we were walking down the stairs of Old Main last night, you know, hobbling down the stairs as we were, and he said, your knees, Steve. And I said, I know, my knees. You know? And uh, he said sometimes he even has trouble with his legs, too. So. Mm -hmm. I have an, an excuse in some ways, but it's not my knees. When I first started at Geneva, um, I never had been in a place where there was humidity before my whole life, and I didn't really understand the weather here at all, and you know, I didn't really want to either. And, you know, but I had a bicycle, and I liked the bicycle a lot, and I was biking up to the Geneva Arms to study with some friends for a test the next morning. I don't know what happened quite completely. i still not quite sure what happened because it was traumatic and mysterious to me, but I had an accident on my bicycle and in the dark, and I, I was on the ground, and I, I couldn't stand up. And I remember thinking, you know, I couldn't see anything, and I just, my foot didn't work for some reason, and I kind of pushed my way up on the bicycle and you know, hobbled to a street light, and I saw there was a lot of blood coming out of my ankle, and I thought, <laughs> I hadn't been to the hospital since I was born, really, and I thought, well, I don't know what happened, really, so I hobbled over to the arms and the, hobbled up the steps, and of course, the guys in the dorm in the room there all started laughing really big at me, like, ha, 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 you know, let's wash it off and get on with our studying, you know, and well, it just wouldn't wash away, and you know, after about a half an hour, this sort of slowly, slowly, the dawning recognition, like, this was not going to wash away, was it? You know, and kind of eventually somebody said, maybe we should go to the hospital. I thought, the hospital? I don't want to go to the hospital. And I did, spent the night there. And I think, like, if it happened to my kid, that wouldn't happen quite this way. I don't think it probably would. But this was the Beaver Falls Hospital, just a few, few blocks from here originally. I don't know where it still is there or not, really. But I severed my Achilles tendon in that bicycle accident. It was ripped apart, actually. So it wasn't like a neat, like, you know, cut. It was like ripped apart, you know. And uh, a general surgeon who never had done anything like that in his whole life put my ankle, to, my hand of that together, you know, over several hours. And I wake up groggily in the hospital, as you do with general anesthesia, thinking, what did you do? And I broke into tears because there's was cast in my leg from my hip down to my toes and thinking, what did you do to me? You know, and anyway, years later, my foot's still numb, you know, and, and uh, it doesn't work in quite the same way as my other leg does. I can walk and I can, I love to bicycle still. I can swim easily. I just can't run very well. And, and uh, but, Brad, that happened to me and that's why I was gingerly walking. And what about you, you know? So, so why do we see the world the way we do? Why do we care about things that we care about? Some of you already know that I believe this to be true, that most of life is pretty autobiographical. And that's true for everyone everywhere. My great-grandparents are buried in Grandview Cemetery overlooking the Beaver River and the valley out beyond. Right next to a family named the Clarence Edward McCartney family, actually. They were long gone before I came into being, of course, but I've gone up there a few times in my life thinking, so who were you and why did you guys know each other? And I know that my grandfather and Clarence Edmund McCartney were boyhood friends, we used to walk to school together. Um, but, you know, it's a story I don't know. I wish I knew more about it than I do. I just know that my grandparents, you know, and their you know, graves are somehow resting in peace, you know, looking out over this whole Beaver Falls and Beaver Valley area. Um, my Father's family moved from Switzerland to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, some centuries ago, uh, eventually finding their way from probably a big farming family to and deciding there were jobs to be had beyond the farming family and that there weren't enough land for everybody to probably to keep farming. And some of them moved to Beaver Falls, actually. And my great grandfather built the third house on College Hill. Um, and my father was born on College Hill in a different house. For several generations, my family gave themselves to building Beaver Falls, living here and dying here. My two paternal great-grandfathers were stonemasons who spent years creating Geneva's Old Main. My paternal grandfather gave some of his years of his life in a steel mill 
this probably a few blocks from here. I'm not quite sure whether it's even there anymore, really. But for a time assigned to making the engine parts that became the spirit of St. Louis, that famous airplane. And I grew up with this story, you know, far away in California. You know, my grandfather, who died before I was born, I, your grandfather did this. And, of course, I didn't quite know what it all meant, but it happened just here, you know, within a mile or so of where we are tonight. But spending the days of his life, you know, what, getting downtown to, from College Hill and, you know, steel mill and manufacturing the steel parts to make an engine and whatever else is required for that airplane. My father assumed that he would do the same, same thing, enter into the same world, I think, when he graduated from Beaver Falls High School. But his principal entered in one day in the springtime of his last year there as a senior, and it changed my dad's life for the rest of his life. The principal said, I think you need to go to college. You know, and in my dad's own family history, that had never happened before, actually. You know, just wasn't what they did in his family. But the principal said, I'm going to make sure this happens. You know, and it's a name that's long gone in the fa our family lore, and I don't know who he was, but I realized, looking back, that that you know, oversight, that insight, that care on the part of an educator for one of his students, you know, somehow watching, listening, paying attention to who was there, what they were doing, and what they should be doing, took my father into the office and said, I think you need to do this, really. And I'm going to call somebody and la, 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 la. And my father spent, you know, a couple of years at Geneva before World War II came into full force and all the guys of his 20-year-old life in Beaver Falls went off to, into, the, into the war. Um, well, you know, we didn't stay in Beaver Falls. My father married somebody from Colorado, where I was born, and I grew up in California, and my father spent most of his life as a scientist for the University of California, in a million miles away, really, from Beaver Falls. This is an industrial, now post-industrial city. My father's work became as a plant pathologist for the University of California, working in what? In California's agricultural world, uh, helping plants to grow more healthy and to not die as they should, as they were prone to die for different diseases. It seems so, 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 so far away, of course, from Beaver Falls and College Hill. Uh, and, uh, and it happened in some ways, substantively, significantly, out of a conversation just a few blocks from here in the Beaver Falls High School, like, who were you and why did you see my dad and how do you even know who he was? Because there was a whole school full of kids. And, and what did you, what'd you say? Because it was a conversation passed on to me. I'm one of four boys in the family. I'm the only one who came back to the Beaver Vale to go to school and wasn't required in my family, but I made that choice. And you know, my brothers maybe you know, knew it would require because they all ended up living in the West and I ended up you know, not doing that. And, you know, and, uh, but given tonight's focus, Brad and, and uh, um, Keith, I thought I should say to you people that when I was a student at Geneva, um, my instincts were already beginning to rumble forward into what's happening here tonight in this conversation. I had a roommate who was a good friend, and, and uh, we were living off campus, and I said to him with some determination, we need to find a little family-owned grocery store to buy our little tidbits we're going to eat in the course of the week. Of course, we had almost no money, and you know, but you know, he was determined to go down to Kroger's at the bottom of College Hill to buy, because it, it's just more... It makes more sense, Steve. And I said, no, it doesn't at all. You know, I found a little Italian grocery store somewhere kind of within a block or two or three from right here, actually. A mom and a pop who had a little grocery store, and it was, you know, not very wide, and the shelves were full up to the very top, really. But I biked down, you know, September through May in the course of the year with my little backpack on and, and determined, actually, that whatever I needed to eat in the course of the week, I'd buy from this mom and pop grocery store. Why? Well, it mattered to me in some ways to maintain something about humanity and community, you know, in a place like Beaver Falls. Uh, the steel crash hadn't happened by that at that point. I mean, it wasn't as if somehow there was impending economic doom for the city. It just seemed to me that if I was going to be growing up into the world, that I needed to make economic choices in my life, even as small and minimal as they were as a 21-year-old, you know, on a bicycle, but biking down the hill across the city, and buying whatever I was going to buy from a little mom-and-pop Italian grocery store family, actually. So you see, in some ways, my being here tonight has an honest history. There's an autobiographical you know, thread that you know, brings me to this place tonight, and I'm glad to be here, actually. Very glad to be here. 
the middle years of the 20th century were high rolling ones, for, of course, for Beaver Falls and for Western Pennsylvania. Um, most of America and some of the rest of the world knows this as stiller nation after, after all, of course. The Steelers, of course, are this part of the world, you know. It isn't just Pittsburgh and Western PA, but of course it's somehow Eastern Ohio and it's Northern West Virginia. And there's something about this 25, 50 mile, 75, 100 mile radius around Pittsburgh, which makes, of course, an unusual social geography, you know, that is not repeated any place else in America as far as I, as I, as I know it. I mean, how is it that, you know, town by town, city by city, you know, have their own little Methodist college and their own Presbyterian college and their own little la 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 la. You think, what, what happened here in this part of America? Because it's not true in New Mexico. It isn't true in California. It's not true in Massachusetts. It's not true in, you know, Michigan. I mean, there's something about here, historically, in the geography, the people in the place of this part of America that made this be like, and we'll start one here too, actually. We'll do this, actually. Some of you know, of course, the dynamic and the history and the ethos of the CCO, which, of course, grew out of the same you know, realization over time. Well, it's not true in you know, Minnesota. It isn't true in Illinois. But you know, in Western PA, it is true in the fact that every little town has a college or a university, you know, which was the early, the genesis, really, of there being a CCO along the way. Um, well, you know, that's this place. And, of course, part of that, might be part and possible to all that was, of course, the never-ending need for more, you know, railroads, you know, in America and the rest of the world. And so these long pieces of steel, you know, constructed in the steel mills of Western PVA and the long tubes to put into the ground to make America work as a, as a, as a place to, to live, live and move and have your being, um, it's not quite holding on, actually. Um, um, but it all happened here, of course. In the middle years of the 20th century, it was burgeoning. It just was never ending, it seemed like. And Beaver Falls was like that. Some of you, of course, pay more attention to the strange dynamic of quarterbacks growing up in this part of America. I think so you did, and, and you did, and then you did, and you did, and you did too, really? Like, where did all this come from, really? And you know that part of the story, of course, is that these were the kids of steel workers, people who were in the steel mills of western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area, who somehow were, learned to live in and grow up in a hard scrabble world and were tough little kids and could throw a ball or run fast or push you around more than, than he could. And, you know, and of course, like, really, it happened again and again and again and again here, really? I mean, how could Joe Namath and Joe Montana both be from? And you think, it is true, though, isn't it, really? It is true, actually. Yeah. But it seemed like that would never stop with the tons and tons of steel products and the millions and millions of dollars earned through the steel economy of Western Pennsylvania. But the promise of good work was not sustainable. And you already talked about that tonight. Of what happened in the 1960s, the 70s, the 80s, finally in 83, when all sort of the doors just closed. You know, they just closed on still being made in Western Pennsylvania. And you think, how'd that possibly ever happen? I'm not going to explore that really with any detail at all tonight. I read about it, and I know you've lived it and read about it yourselves tonight. Mm -hmm. But I'll say it again, the promise of good work, which has seemed in some ways to bring people here, like my own family from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, that possibly they could do this if they came here. Well, it wasn't sustainable, finally, over time. The robber barons on the one side, we could name them, couldn't we? Nah, 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 nah. Robber barons were over here, of course. This name, two big ones, because there's a university in their name, of course, the Carnegie's and the Mellons of the world. And then, of course, on the other side, there was the unionized steel industry, steel, steel workers of this part of America. And I would say, as I watched it and have read about it, they both went for the jugular. They both went for the jugular. Unwilling and unable to imagine anything other than a go for the jugular economy. So, chicken and egg here, you know, who was more responsible than the other? We could probably go there, of course, and we could talk about that afterwards if you want to. But it seemed to me as I watched, have watched it and have read about it, it was clearly on the side rubber barons, you know, did what they did. And there was, you know, there were famous homestead strikes along the way and injustice, more injustice, and more evil was perpetrated and, you know, 
brutality brought into being. And no, 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 and we don't care. We're going to close the gates. You know, you want a job? Come back. You know, no, you know. Um, and uh, but it wasn't only on that side. I mean, the, the greed goes all kinds of ways here. You know, and there was greed on the side of the steelworkers too, who you know were imagining in some ways for a, you know, a certain skill level of of of, of labor, a kind of eco financial return, which in some ways didn't work given what was required of the work itself, really, um, is my perspective on it. But as I watched all that, I found myself in my own reading, thinking through one more time again, the interesting, fascinating historical note that Karl Marx and Charles Dickens were writing about the very same issue in the very same city at the very same time. Do you know that? In the 1850s, for a decade, both were living in London, both writing about what? Industrializing Europe. Industrializing England, to be specific, actually. We call their stories what? Well, we call one Das Kapital. Not a very happy you know, title for a book. Um, the other one we like a lot better. It's called A Christmas Carol. Uh, um, and A Christmas Carol got somehow picked out in history. <laughs> and we just keep reading it and watching it year after year after year after year. And even the Muppets do it now, of course. You know? I mean, like... You think, so what did you guys, I mean, this is a long ways from Karl Marx, isn't it, though? I mean, Mr. Muppet, you know? I mean, but what's the story about, of course? It's really the story that Marx is talking about, isn't it? It's a story of the haves and the have-nots. The story, really, of the, the greedy capitalist, you know, and the laborer who has no honest return for his labor. Um, and, of course, you know, in miniature form, in microscopic version of the, of the larger landscape of Marx's critique, what Dickens has done is taken up the very same question. Isn't, isn't it interesting to think about that? You know, they both saw the very same thing, which in some ways prefigures you know, the unrolling of an industrial economy in Europe and America over the next 100 years, essentially. You know, but it seemed like, well, you know, I mean, apart from that sort of grand dark night of the soul that Ebenezer Scrooge goes through, you know, I mean, he was set to, you know, to die for his sins. You know, that night. Um, and uh, again, it's microscopic. It is not as if somehow, you know, the systemic critique of Marx was manifest in Dickens' own, you know, analysis in the, in the novel. But clearly, if you hold them together, you realize that this question of, you know, who has money, who has resource, what do we get done in the world, and what's it mean for the people who work in the world? You see, this is a longer story than Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. It rumbles back across time. It's a, it's a deeper story. It's a more complex story, even though its manifestation here is what it is, and we all you know, live with ha, the arg, you know, and the groan, you know, and the sigh of thinking, oh, Beaver Falls, you know, why is that storefront empty, really? It makes me groan, and I wish it was not that way. You know? um, and clearly, my father's growing up in this part of America, in this particular town. It didn't seem to be that way. It wasn't going to be that way. As I said, you know, and I think it's worth us noting for tonight, the promise of that kind of work, that good work that was there then, was not sustainable. Think about the relationship between Pittsburgh and Detroit for a moment here. But Pittsburgh and Detroit, because they're different cities, of course, aren't they? But they've had interesting stories which are parallel in their own different kinds of ways. They're different stories, but they're stories we're thinking about together. Detroit's story is not your story, but you know, I know in growing up when I did and where I did that even in California, not California PA, but the real California, um, the story was that you know, if you wanted to sort of put your finger to the wind about how America was doing economically, look at Detroit. How's Detroit doing? You know, well, it isn't, of course, true anymore at all to ask that question. Maybe more how you know, Silicon Valley is doing or something like that. But... Detroit was what? Well, it was a place which, where the big three made cars. And you know, America bought their cars from the big three in Detroit. I remember how shocked I was when my dad told me one time a story of somebody who'd come to visit our town in, in California who was from Detroit. He said, oh, people in Detroit actually know the real story. You don't want to buy a Friday or a Monday car in Detroit. So like the neighbors of the folks working in the you know, automaking, you know, 
plants there knew not to buy Friday cars because, of course, tomorrow's the weekend and they stopped making good cars on Friday. On Monday, they're so bummed having to come back to work and the dehumanizing character of the work that the assembly line was in Detroit that they weren't paying attention either. They didn't make good cars. So if you could all find a, a Wednesday serial number, make sure you get a Wednesday serial number. And so that was the local wisdom in Detroit. Well, you just think about that and you realize that at some point, of course, when we all watched, you know, in their private jets, the CEOs of the big three automakers fly to Washington, D.C. and say, huh, we're out of money, you know, please, you know, you know, help us, you know, because we're done with, apart from a big handout from the federal government. You realize you can't keep doing things like that in the world that really exists, in the world that is really there. I'll talk about this more tomorrow night in the address about m and saving the world. But in Wendell Berry's language, it's the greater economy and the lesser economy bumping up against each other. You can't keep, in some ways, acting against the grain of the universe economically, the way you imagine work, how work gets done, and actually flourish as human beings. It doesn't work that way. And Americans pretty quickly begin to realize you want a better car, buy a Toyota. You know? Then just buy a Honda instead, actually. Or buy a Kia today. You, know? you, could, do, you could find a car that actually that somebody cared about and actually made with intention and design and integrity. You know? Well, don't buy an American car after all. Ah! You know? Don't buy an American car. You know? Because it, of course, might have been made on Friday. You know? Why would you do that? That'd be stupid. Really. You know? It isn't the same story in Pittsburgh. It isn't that story. But you begin to realize, of course, that there are certain ways that work is imagined. Where in some ways, the hope of work, <laughs> the promise of work, the humanity of work, the creativity of work, the responsibility of work, it just gets excised, you know, scissor by scissor by scissor by scissor, cut by cut by cut, and you find yourself thinking, you know, there isn't anything about me that actually is a human being that's asked to contribute to anything that's being done here today. You know? And it just doesn't work finally. It doesn't work in the end, in this world that actually is really there. We could talk more about all that. If the promise of good work was not sustainable, um, and you know, in the strangeness of history, it's now the mon monopolistic UPMC, which owns the city of Pittsburgh. You know, and if you ever were confused about that, just look and see who's named on top of the U.S. Steel Building. You know, it is not Mr. Carnegie after all. You know, it's UPMC because, of course, they play monopoly with big money. You know, but all the hotels on the board. You know. Uh, I work on a project that's differently imagined, actually. And uh, we'll talk again more about it tomorrow night, uh, frontally and explicitly. But it's been called simply the economics of mutuality. Economics of mutuality. And it seems to me to have something to say to what you guys have met together tonight to both ponder and consider and plan for and, and work at as the Milltown Institute. You see, it's an economics, an economic vision, a paradigm, where everyone is a stakeholder and everyone wins. I would say flat out, it is not heaven come to earth. You know? It is not, in fact, all things that ought to be in the world finally manifest in time and space. It's not that, really. It is not all things that God wants to happen in the world finally having come into being because I'm involved in it because anybody else is. Because that's not going to be the world we live in. It just isn't going to be until... You know, the grand consummation. It won't be that way. You know, in Gandalf's wise words to, you know, uh, Sam Gamgee, um, there will be a day when everything sad becomes untrue, but it's not because of this project yet. Really. But as I said last night to one of the questions, you know, at this point in my life, I've come to believe that if I could give my own heart to working to signposts of the way things ought to be in the world, I'll be a happy man. But you see, signpost doesn't require that everything happen. That all good things come into being. You know. It doesn't require that Beaver Falls you know, have an utter, complete, radical transformation. Every, every, every. We don't live in that world, actually. You know. So signpost for me is a pretty good word. Because you see, it, in, it, it argues that, in fact, to work for something that's honest and true, it's okay. In fact, that's the best you get in this life, actually. So why not give yourself to that? 
a signpost. So for me, the economics of mutuality is a signpost of what should be, what could be, I would even argue, what someday will be. It began with a conversation of a, a capitalist, you know, maybe a greedy capitalist, but not necessarily as greedy as Ebenezer Scrooge or somebody else you might want to name here. Um, but he actually did say to his chief economist, how much money should we make this year? Now, wouldn't it be an interesting question to imagine the chief economist for, you know, Mr. Carnegie to ask, how much money should we make this year? Well, this happened actually for the Mars Corporation in Washington, D.C., which makes, among other things, M&Ms. And the chief economist actually is a Huguenot by religious historical conviction in history um, from the mountains of France. If anybody knows the story of Les Chambon and the Huguenots who kept the Jews during the Holocaust years, Bruno Roche's family is from Les Chambon, actually, as is his wife's family. He, he grew up in Paris, went to the Paris School of Economics, you know, began working for the Mars Corporation as a you know, 25-year-old or something. And then 20 years later, finds himself the chief economist and asked by one of the owners of the company, one of the three Mars siblings, because it's a family-owned company, how much money should we make this year? And Bruno says, well, tell me more about this. And he said, well, you see, if we take everything in here, then somebody along the way gets screwed. I wasn't there in the conversation. I don't know if the word screwed was really used that, that day, but it was something like that. You know, Somebody gets screwed, really, if we take everything in. Now, you see, this was not you know, proposing that the Mars corporations began giving away M&Ms to the world you know, in some new-faced uh, you know, socialist economy. That was not the point of the conversation. It was, you see, because we're a family-owned company, we want to keep making money next year and the year after that and into the future. We want to have a sustained profitability over time. So here it again, you know, an economic vision where everyone is a stakeholder, not just every human being, not just owners and laborers, but the stakeholders include, to put it quite large brush stroke and iconically, I suppose, a little bit, it is the stakeholders include not only people and the planet, but profit too. And so the idea was how would we remunerate all three in an honest way. How do we hold all three together and remunerate all three in this idea of an economic solution? Now, I will talk more about it tomorrow night. But I want to say to you, you know, along the way, I did give these executives from Mars, Wendell Berry's you know, prescient essay called Two Economies. It does talk about a greater economy and a lesser economy, about the world that really is there, the greater economy, Reality, he says, you can call it what you want to call it. And Barry says, I call it the kingdom of God, but you can call it what you want to call it. You know? Then there's the lesser economy. The lesser economy, of course, includes downtown Beaver Falls, you know, includes Beaver County, you know, includes Pennsylvania. You know? In various terms, those are all lesser economies. Even Orem's Donuts, you know, a block away, you know, best donuts in Pennsylvania. Was that what they were thinking about a few weeks ago? Like, in the whole place of Pennsylvania, Orem's Donuts, the Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. Ah! You know, I should get one before, while I'm here, I think, probably. You know. But even Orm's Donuts, as good as it is, in various terms, is a lesser economy. You know, because they make up their own numbers. They have to, to be in business year by year by year, checking them quarterly over the course of the year. But Barry's point is that you can do that for a while, but eventually the lesser economies have to bump up against the reality of the greater economy. I'll talk more about this tomorrow night. But because of that essay, the chief economist from Mars said to me, can we talk to this guy? So we made arrangements to fly down to Kentucky to spend a day with Barry on his farm talking about this idea of a different way to imagine economic life in the world. How we live together, how we work together, what it means to ha you know, invest in and re receive from and work together in some way which is more complex than how we typically have imagined it. If only you know, the true stakeholders, the owners, are the ones who are that at the end of the day, those who have to be remunerated. Some of you know this conversation we had, and I'll just repeat it for you tonight again. But at the end of the day, he said to us, you see, if you want to make money for a year, you ask certain questions, don't you? But you want to make money for 100 years, you have to ask other questions. And I would say that this project that I've gotten involved in, and more and more so as the years have passed, um, is really a 100-year conversation. It's the questions that, are not necessarily written into 
something that is going to take a long time to work it out, you know, to keep at it, to keep refining it, to keep thinking it through, to keep making choices on the basis of we believe this to be true. We're going to try it again and again and again and again. Maybe you have seen or listened to Barry's essay, uh, an address he gave when he received the annual Jefferson, Pri Jefferson Prize for the Humanities in America, uh, given at the Kennedy Center six years ago or so. It's titled wonderfully, It All Turns on Affection. It All Turns on Affection. Do you know the essay? Have you heard, heard this at all? Some of you have, really. Uh, but he begins the, his address in this grand you know, occasion at the Kennedy Center, you know, packed out opera house, and, you know, no seats left, really. He begins talking about his own autobiographical you know, uh, story of his own life, about how his grandfather and his grandfather's brothers were all tobacco farmers in Kentucky at the turn of the last century, and how they spent the whole year you know, planting, cultivating, you know, finally harvesting the tobacco, curing the tobacco, finally getting together one night to determine how much money do we need to make this year to make it for the next year. Well, my brother said, I need this much. And my brother, I need this much. Really. And, well, one brother was sent off to Louisville the next morning with a load of tobacco. Comes back at the end of the day, and, and he says with a grim face, we made nothing this year. We made no money this year at all. Well, Barry's standing there, of course, with a weight to his words, and then he says, but somebody made a lot of money that year, actually. His name was James B. Duke. He was the president of the American Tobacco Company. Mm -hmm. And he screwed the market. Mm -hmm. He cheated the market that year and years after that. He just cheated. He didn't play by the rules that anybody who actually cared about, you know, anybody else would, would work by. Now, what did he do? <laughs> Wendell Berry says he built a university out of that cheat money he stole from other people, actually, you know. Imagine a beautiful campus and beautiful stone buildings and endow it forever and ever and ever and ever, really, with his money, really. You know? and he says, I've been there on that campus giving lectures. It says, one of the ironies of my life is being invited to lecture at Duke University and walking by that statue in the middle of the campus with James B. Duke with a big cigar like this. You know, and it says, industrialist, philanthropist. And Barry says, I almost throw up. You know, Because I realize he stole from my grandfather and his brothers to make his money. Now, Barry goes on for another 50 minutes or so in this address, talking about, in fact, how an economic vision for human flourishing has to require an affection for other people. It all turns on affection. What's affection mean for Barry? It's a sense of responsibility for other people. It's a sense of, you know, this isn't just about me. You know? It's a sense, in fact, that, you know, I do my work, but... My work has consequence for you. That I make decisions, but my decisions have meaning for your life too. That this isn't just about me all the time. It has to somehow be about you too. Now for him, if most of life is pretty autobiographical, he can never in his life get away from that tragic year when his grandfather and brothers said, we made no money this year. After all the blood, sweat, and tears of this year, you know, and we made nothing this year. So for an hour that night, you know, he pushes and pushes and you know, explains and explains again and argues, argues some more about why, in fact, a healthy social ecology requires affection at the very heart of it. Affection is what, in some ways, is not very far from where Keith began us tonight. It's the question of love, isn't it? Of what do you love? You, know, you guys are busy people with full lives, and yet here you are tonight in this you know, building downtown Beaver Falls. And why? Because in some strange, wonderful reading of your own hearts, you want to be here you know, because you love this place, you know, because it matters to you. you know. It isn't just tonight and this week, because somehow out of, you know, days and weeks and years of your lives, you said, you know, of all the other things going on in the world, you know, I do love what this place represents, actually. I care about it, actually. You say when you care about it, you know, it all turned on affection, actually, for everybody, everybody. In this project that I've gotten involved with, with the Marsh Corporation, um, there's a book now that if you'd be interested, it's available for everybody. It isn't that expensive to get. You could get it for a few of you and pass it around if you wanted to. 
but it's called completing capitalism. Heal business to heal the world. I was a part of the discussion. I wasn't the decider, but I was asked, what do you think about the subtitle, the title here? And I think I, I know that part of my own input into this, as I told you know, Russell you know, uh, uh, before supper tonight, um, he was a good Hebrew student. I was a very frail Hebrew student. You know? and I remember like this and this, and that's about it, really. And he actually teaches Hebrew of all things. You know? but I never got that far. You know? I caught a few words along the way. And one of the words I remembered, you know, images I remembered from my reading of years and years was tikkun olam, tikkun olam. I'm not sure it's actually used in the Bible. Maybe it is. I just don't even know, but it's probably not. But it's a Hebrew image, really, to repair the world. And so deep into the, the, the discussions about this idea of economics and mutuality and what its meaning would be for life in the wider world, I said to these guys, the executives from Mars, there's this beautiful imagery from the Hebrew world and worldview, at least. And it's called tikkun olam. And you see, what we're talking about here in our vision for a, a, a rethinking the business of business, it's actually more than just you know, getting this business in order right, but it's actually for the sake of healing the world, isn't it? Really? Repairing what was broken in the world. Um, so not throwing out capitalism, but completing capitalism is the title of the book. Well, the good friends, some of you I know very well, others I don't, of course. What are, what are those hundred-year questions of Wendell Berry's for you here tonight? for Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, for the Milltown Institute. Those hundred-year questions that nourish the possibility of human flourishing across generations here in this city, in this place. I spent about 10 years of my life reading the book of Daniel again and again and again and again for lots of reasons, perhaps. One of them was it seemed to be one of the only places in the whole Bible you could say, this whole book is about vocation, isn't it? And I am interested in what vocation means and where it comes from and how it gets worked out. So I just kept reading and reading the book of Daniel, trying to figure out, so what does this mean in Daniel's life? It is that story, isn't it, from beginning to end. It is the story, of course, of Jeremiah, um, the previous book, you know, writing in a chapter these famous words, seek the flourishing of the city. Plant trees, build houses, get married, have kids. Um, pray for the city to flourish, because you see, unless it flourishes, you won't flourish. Those sober words, actually. If it doesn't flourish, you won't flourish. Right? And who's he writing those words to? Well, to Daniel. And to Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego and the exiles in Babylon. And you might even say, you know, it might be easier to pray for, let's pick a place, Highland Park, Pittsburgh, you know, you know, Nice part of Pittsburgh to live in. How about, how about Swickley? It'd be easier to pray for Swickley, wouldn't it, really? No. no. May Swickley flourish. You know, wouldn't be a bad prayer to pray, you know, but it's a different prayer than praying for the Milltown, isn't it? You know, for Beaver Falls. You know, to pray for Beaver Falls to flourish? What's intriguing to me about Daniel and the reading I've done of it is that you get through those first seven chapters, which are more easy to understand. You get into the next seven chapters and you think, I have no idea what this goat with seven horns is about. And Brad, you don't either, really. I mean, you might say you do, but I don't think you do, really. Like, what does it possibly mean, a goat with seven horns? I don't know, really. What is interesting to me is every one of those dreams that have Daniel's names on the dreams, or his dreams with his name on them, the text says something like, and Daniel couldn't sleep that night, you know, and Daniel's face was flushed, you know. And the very last words in the whole book about Daniel, literally, are, and Daniel was perplexed. And Daniel was perplexed. Well, I mean, in the craziness of my own heart, people, I would say those have been good words for my soul, you know, to read, and Daniel was perplexed. He had visions. He had dreams. You know, he gave his whole life to trying to work them out to seek the flourishing of his city. I mean, like, if you read in those second, the second half of the book, literally the part of the scroll that Jeremiah's, you know, words come from are referenced in the second half of Daniel, the same chapter we would call it in, you know, in our own language today. Um, Daniel knew the words, and those words were really for Daniel and his friends. 
Seek the flourishing of your city. Pray for it. Because if it doesn't flourish, you won't flourish. Build houses, you know, and plant trees, and get married and have kids, really. Because you see, that's what it means to see the f city flourishing. Babylon, of all places. Iconically, Babylon it is. Now, final word to you tonight. Seek the flourishing of the city of Beaver Falls. Get married. Have children. Build, build houses. Plant trees. Pray for the city to flourish, because if it does not flourish, you will not flourish. Amen.